find the slides, sorry. I, th I think this follows on really well from what the judges uh, just presented and some of the challenges that um, we've lived out in Australia. Um, one of the key things, just as we're bringing up the slides, that the, the message here is conducting a Royal Commission is one part, an inquiry, one part. It's what happens after is the important bit. And um, what, what we measure it on in terms of has it improved children's safety and has it had an impact on survivors' lives um, so, so that their lives can be uh, acknowledged, their experience acknowledged, and the services that they are able to access are responsive to their needs. And, and I think one of the things also that we need to be saying as well, what, what a Royal Commission does, it moves something from the private to the public. And I think that is one of the key jobs of the Royal Commission and what, the, what was uh, presented in the sense of the Australian Royal Commission. And we're going to talk to that. There's two quotes up here, one from our Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, who established the Royal Commission. And um, we've had a couple of Prime Ministers, I think we've had three since Julia Gillard. Um, but the commitment there that started this it needs to be really acknowledged, that um, it, it, it is a moment in time, a unique moment in time. And then the final um, quote there from earlier this year from our chair, uh, Justice Peter McLennan, um, really acknowledging what this means for survivors, that an effective response needs to be put hand in hand with the response to survivors, but also the response that improves the safety of children today. Now, I'm just going to go very quickly through the terms of reference. These are all available on the website and our, our presentations available. The, the first part of the terms of reference of the Royal Commission had a real focus on how do we improve the safety of institutions today? What is best practice? What can be learnt from mistakes of the past? And how those mistakes can be acknowledged and be transparent? And looking at the impediments that were blocks for organisations, survivors, families in, in challenging those, those, those um, issues that stopped these investigations. And then the terms of reference really turn to the, the experience of survivors, the opportunities to share the experience, uh, the opportunities for so the state and authorities to bear witness to that experience. And looking at how the adequacy of the, the response requires that organisation and state commitment. What does that mean for laws? What does that mean for criminal justice laws where we still have an adversarial system where children can be questioned, survivors can be questioned on, and their credibility put on trial rather than the perpetrator put on trial. <coughs> now, the Royal Commission was really centred around three major activities. Uh, first of all, public hearings. And public hearings uh, took the form of case studies. There are 57. And case studies um, were centred around an institution or particular practice. So there were, for example, four case studies focused on uh, the Catholic Church, a number of case studies on other institutions, other issues around how child protection may respond to complaints, how police respond, uh, et cetera. Then there was uh, the opportunity for public submissions, both from survivors, organisations, as well as research. There were over 100 pieces of uh, research conducted that ranged from uh, investigation of how criminal justice responses uh, uh, were conducted, responding to treatment for perpetrators, through to investigating what does grooming mean, um, how do we define it, how do we detect grooming, looking at, at police checks for uh, uh, safe to work with children. Um, there were a wide range. And then a, a very important part of the Royal Commission was to 
uh, have private sessions where survivors were given the opportunity to, to come to a commissioner and a group of other officials from the Royal Commission and to tell their stories, to bear witness. And that information was then used in a confidential way to establish some findings and investigations. Around, wrapped around that, there were counselling services, community engagement and other services established to support survivors on that journey to a private session or a public hearing. Okay, the, the final report that's due not long, um, a couple of months away, um, or less than a month away, um, will cover these, these points, particularly focusing on how we understand how abuse occurred. What, are, what will a child safe institution look like? What can we learn uh, in terms of interventions for children? Um, and also, uh, how do we address um, redress and civil litigation in a way that not only addresses ongoing service needs, but the issue of restitution and compensation? Um, just, just for people to have an understanding of, of this, in a sense of the final report I've just been told, which is handed down on 15 December, will go to our Governor General. It will stand a metre and a half high. It will, the recommendation on the criminal justice system alone runs to over 2,000 pages, with 85 recommendations, which will significantly change our, our criminal justice system. This report, this investigation, in a sense, isn't just about institutions. It will change our whole child protection system. It will be children who are sexually abused in homes, by family members, everybody. The response changes for everybody because of this, and the system gets improved because of this. Although the starting place is about institutions, the flow-on effect, it's throughout the whole system, including the prison systems around that. OK, so let's get to some, some facts and figures here. And it's difficult, in a sense, for, for us. You know, there's 4,000 institutions that have been investigated and come to notice. There's more than 2,000 survivors supported, uh, reported of sexual abuse in Catholic institutions alone. We've got 500 survivors reported abuse in Anglican institutions. We've got 250 reported in Salvation Army. In total, the uh, Royal Commission estimates almost 40,000 survivors were sexually abused in institutions and by non-government and 20,000 in state-run institutions. <coughs> There's more than 6,500 people who gave private evidence said more than one person had abused them. We've had so far, we're going to have more than 8,000 private sessions by the commissions. There's six commissioners. Some commissioners have heard more than others. They've heard 1,500 private sessions from people about the, their experience of abuse and what's happened to them. There's been 2,400 referrals to authorities. These are new prosecutions. The police services in uh, Australia at times are becoming overwhelmed by the number of historical abuses we're now taking to court. There's a number of inquiries, etc. This, in a sense, these, the, the men in us and the women have been sitting there on this. This is now the opportunity to start to address the legacy of the past. This is not about the past. We're about talking about people living with this in the present. And I think, I think some key learning from survivors' experience of going to uh, private sessions is the quality of that response is so critical. And, and I think uh, the judge's presentation, that really highlights the presence of being real, the officials being real and present um, for those hearings is so critical to the quality outcomes. And setting up the systems around that is very important. And I think by a, as a state system, we're now becoming to understand, the government and the, the public are coming to understand the extent of the problem, which the private kind of discussions, well, you don't, with single cases, we don't get to picture of how bad this is. And I'll speak to this a bit more. We, but 64% of those who want to come to this commission were males. This is not the place where uh, uh, females are at greater uh, risk. It's males are at greater risk because they are placed in these institutions or engaged with these public institutions in different ways. What we've learned is there's particular places where men are at, males are at greater risk than where females are at greater risk. We understand as well there's a bit of change going over time in the sense of uh, the proportion of males to females now about where, who's at risk where and the ages of which they're at risk. And we understand that 
once you've been in one institution and sex abused in one place, then you are more likely, sometimes you're being moved through the system, you have greater vulnerabilities, and you're more likely to get abused. So some people reported, you know, multiple instances of sexual abuse, and, and more than one, you know, 6%, more than three different institutions where they were sexually assaulted and sexually abused. Um, so there's, we can go to this in a bit more detail. And when Patrick says we had four hearings in, in relation to the Catholic Church, one of those hearings took over three weeks. They had the capacity to compel witnesses to attend. You couldn't say, I won't attend. The, um, the survivors spoke in person at those public hearings. They were recorded. Sometimes they didn't uh, see their faces, but sometimes they did speak. Um, and, and also, all those bishops and others were called to account. What we learned about the Catholic Church, and those are the figures produced by the Catholic Church. They're not the figures that we understand of what the reality of this world is. This is what they've got reported on. Um, those 4,444 complainants, 78% of those victims were male. And if you look at the ages at which those places, those offences, uh, when those took place, in a sense of we learned about where the high-risk places were for some of those boys and girls. And for boys, it was an altar boy. You're high risk. We also understand the challenges for those boys to come forward and talk about this when their family is absolutely embedded with the religion and they wanted to protect their parents so they didn't lose their faith. So these boys held on to the stories of the abuse and the experiences they'd had to take care. This is real courage to take care for their love of their parents. But we also know that some institutions, as, as uh, Ken mentioned, St. John of God, 40% of the priests of St. John of God have now been convicted of sexual offences. 20% of a series of other, other places convicted of offences. There's something wrong with that institution because what we're learning as well is some of those priests didn't start offending until they were in their 30s, might have joined the seminaries when they were in their late teens, early 20s. There's something about this institution. It's not these people joined as pedophiles trying to find this place. There's something about how they, were, how they operated in this system and the opportunities that were provided to them. The Catholic Church, sorry, the Anglican Church isn't immune to all this as well. 75% of the victims, again, were male. We understand also that some sites were really, really dangerous for some of these. And um, the schools, and these are uh, religious schools, some of these, and private schools. Can I just say, in the state in which I work, the private schools, we have heard repeated instances of boys and girls, or boys majority, of being sexually abused in those private schools. They're highly dangerous places, and they removed some of the teachers went between those private schools. State, we don't experience the same uh, repeated abuse, systemic abuse, within state-run schools. These, these parents were thinking they were doing the best thing. Their, parents, their kids knew that, and they didn't want to say it. In one school, uh, when two schools, there was a man named Kevin Lynch. He moved between two schools, Brisbane Boys Grammar and St. Paul's Anglican, Anglican School. He, we know that he sexually abused over, over 100 children in those schools. These are the, this is the top echelon school in Brisbane. Um, and one of the things about it, this was a counsellor, and he used things like um, uh, relaxation exercises, mindfulness exercises to calm the children, and then the process sexually assaulted them. So if you're a practitioner working in this area, don't you start saying to these men, let's do a mindfulness exercise and calm yourself, because it isn't going to work. It's the very same thing that happened by this person. He had a button on the door, and it had a green button to say you could come in, and a red button you could say not to come in. Now, that practice he did in both schools, and what we learn about, and this is when you get into the detail of this, when the Anglican school said, well, we're going to come co and we're going to have girls in about 1993, and they said, you know what, because we've got girls coming here, we need to think about the protection of those girls, so we'll have him that he can no longer have that button on the wall so that at any time, any teacher can be, uh, somebody can walk in. When it was boys, nobody thought about it, but when there was girls coming in, then they start to thought about it. This man then committed suicide the day after he was arrested, and so the justice for those, for those men is not opportune for them. Um, we need also understand the inmate engagement system. One of the things about I've, one of those funded services, the opportunity to provide the assistance to men in prison has been really important. There's been opportunity to do face-to-face, to do telephone. The Royal Commission provided for us um, legal privilege 
we could send documents in and out and prisoners could send documents in and out that nobody in the prison could read. This was agreed at the top level. So then the support that's available for them. Now, we know that in some states, in New South Wales and Victoria, they had a few people come forward. In Queensland, where I, I work, I thought, oh, well, that's, that's kind of an okay figure, but that's nowhere near the figure. But currently in Queensland, we've had about 800 people in prison now come forward and said I was sexually abused. In one of those prisons, over two-thirds of the prisoners have come forward to say that. What we're learning is there's a trajectory in prisons um, that some of the men, it's, it's those guys who are in the boys' homes and then in the youth detention centres, they're the ones, and sexually abused in those sites, are most likely then to be in prison. And we need to have cultural sensitivity for that. The figures that Anthony put up the other day, 26 <coughs> times more likely to be placed in a home if you're from an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander background or into a youth detention centre. Our prisons, uh, I'm at, for the current, it depends which state you're in, you might have a population of 4 or 5% of Aboriginal people in, in that state. But the reality is, in Queensland prisons, over 30% in some prisons are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. In one prison in Queensland, 81% of those people there are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We need to understand the context of uh, invasion and removal from land and how that's disrupted families. And what we've heard around that is also that some of the places where this took place was when they were moved to the missions or they moved onto the systems where boys were placed in dormitories, their sisters were placed in other dormitories, their parents were removed and had to live further away from them. In those dormitories, they were sexually abused, and they're able to sometimes talk to their family member through a fence at times in these places. And they were only maybe they see them at the weekends. And this is for a community which has been moved from their land where their spiritual well-being is about connection to country. And so when we talk about sexual abuse, we cannot, the intergenerational trauma, we can't see it as sexual abuse as the single thing because we're talking about multiple layers of trauma. And so our responses need to be community-based responses in improving those uh, assistance. Now, there's a quote where from that was, you saw Mel do his video. This was the trial. This is Judge Everson saying this trial. What we've understood by working and, and um, investigating in this area and hearing the stories of these men and, and, and of the women, um, particularly these boys' homes, they were brutal institutions. When this judge used the term gulag, he wasn't being, you know, oh, I'm just going to say this flowery word. He was serious about how this institution operated. He took, in, in, you know, in some of these trials we hear, and he used the term also, this was like a Nazi camp. It brought an instance where boys are being raped by a, a, a priest or a brother. Another priest or brother walks in and walks out and leaves him to rape that boy. Where that boy has nowhere to go where they are strapped and brutalized. The strap is a large uh, leather strap with pieces of metal in it. And they're strapped naked in front of other boys, where they're moved in place, and sometimes they're placed in uh, holes in the ground and held for periods of time. Yes? And you think about, well, why didn't you come forward? Well, that some of them did come forward, and they were beaten for coming forward and saying those things about the priest. And in a sense, also, you've got to remember, and this is one of the learnings, and I think for some of the practitioners and, the, and when we're designing the responses to this, these boys, some were taken away for their own care and protection. So they weren't, these are not kids who are already off the rails, some from for their own care and protection. So what happens is you're taken away, you're fractured from your family, you then leave this place, you're put on the street afterwards because you've got no money, you've got nowhere to go afterwards. You then try and find your way in the world, having had this brutal stuff happen to you. You're doing the drink, drugs, you're doing homelessness. You try and find relationships, but those relationships kind of break up and break down. You have children, but then that relationship with your children breaks down. You work physically very hard. You didn't actually receive a good education because you were in a boys' home, and it was like a working farm. And when you talk about these boys, they didn't talk about running away. They talk about escaping. And you go to these places, and uh, they go there, and they have fractured relations. You used your body, because that's all you've got, physically. You're then in your 40s, 50s. Your body is shot. It is completely gone. You can't do the job you used to do. Your back's gone. You can't concrete anymore, anything like that. You have limited resources. You're now then looking around and saying, well, I haven't got a home. I haven't got anything to, to kind of work with that. Uh, my health is going. I'm now looking at aged care, another institution. I don't have a place to go into the home where people can pay for that now, in a sense, like that. And that's the reality of these men's lives. And so sometimes we think about, oh, well, we'll do some recovery or some counselling work. That will not get anywhere near this, 
anywhere near some of this stuff. And it's by having this public inquiry we get to understand some of this. I'm going to just one little go off, off here. I'll put Cardinal Pell up here. Now, one of the things about this, in the sense of we all understand there are allegations of Kaiju Khan Appel which have now come to the fore and he will be facing court around this. And it's a series of allegations in relation to a series of people. Um, one of the things was that the, the, and the, the Royal Commission, he spoke to the Victorian Inquiry, which led into the Royal Commission. Um, I think one of the things about that is the recognition that um, we're now prosecuting some uh, religious orders and other people for failure to protect. And one of the things is they start to say to us is that, oh, I didn't know it was a crime. Right? I was a police officer in London from 1979 to 1994. I arrested somebody in 1979 for childhood sexual abuse. That offence had been on statute for over 200 years at least. Do not tell me you did not know it was a crime. It's also a, a crime, it's a moral crime of sodomy comes from canon law. It came into English law in 1536. This is the law, this is the, the offence, inter Christianus non nominum. It's the offence amongst Christians never to be named because it brings moral shame on all those who tolerate it. And this is the offence that the Catholic Church, other churches have been perpetrating against the children and they could not talk about it because they preach moral authority and here is the offence that is worse than murder because it destroys the soul in their language. They could not talk about it and cannot talk about it in a sense and have difficulty with this because it speaks of the, the moral uh, problem that they are struggling with around that. So we need to be remember about this and understand that context around that. And, and covering on that, you see the culture of the church and that in how the church responded to different moral issues. And there were examples in the Royal Commission where per priests who were perpetrating sexual abuse were sent on sabbatical or retreat. Priests who had uh, not kept to their vows of celibacy and engaged in uh, consensual adult-to-adult -adult sex were expelled from the priesthood. This sends a particular message about how a culture can act with impunity in regard to the safety of children. Um, we're just going to touch on, the, we've now just, the 25th of October, the redress bill came into Parliament. Um, now this is, uh, it says there, and it's looking for, uh, this is a process that we're now underga uh, undergoing in the sense of the Commonwealth Government's put this out there, and we're waiting for the states and the institutions hopefully to sign up, so there's pressure here. It's talking about 10 years at least of services and support for, for victim survivors, up to, up to $150,000 um, for, for uh, those who have survived abuse and been in those institutions. Um, it's a recognition, this is the statement that was made in Parliament only, um, only a few weeks ago, it's recognition and that those institutions who have caused harm, that people have experienced them, to, in order to go to those institutions <coughs> to ask for assistance, is going to be triggering. It's just like an impossible task. It's like, this can't re-traumatise me even more. So we need to create a system where it's not part of that, uh, that removes that away from those institutions so that they don't, they do have the opportunity. And can I just say, as somebody who works in services, there's a whole group of guys I work with who've not gone <coughs> forward to the Royal Commission, aren't in that place yet to be able to do that, but would fit the remit for this. Uh, so we recognise that there's a lot more people to come forward around this. Um, it's also recognising that, uh, that we have to, the institutions have to set, accept responsibility. Now let Patrick wrap up on this. And I think a key bit that is facing Australia at the moment is the actual challenge of how is this going to be financed? What are the mechanisms? It, it's, it's not good enough to say we agree with this. You have to come up with the resources and commitment. Um, I think there's been a number of key learnings and, and I won't go through all these points. But I think understanding the institutional culture um, that created a sense of impunity for perpetrators to act. The thing with grooming is grooming is deliberately uh, presented as normal behaviour. And the thing that um, distinguishes grooming uh, is the motivation of the perpetrator. The perpetrator is not interested in the well-being of the child they present the good acts towards the child as a motivation to sexually abuse. Recognising that centralised idea of power, institutions were investigating themselves. And what did they find? We were not surprised. 
Um, and the institutional responses then flow from that culture where institutions respond on their own behalf to survivors, they reflect that culture in which the abuse occurred. And that needs to be really uh, challenged and that independence is really necessary. There's a consistent story in the uh, stories of male survivors coming to both the public hearings and private sessions that there's been a, a focus on correcting men not the positive growth. Often men are in prison, sent to rehab, sent to mental health, as if something's wrong with them that doesn't acknowledge what happened in the first place. Um, we, we really need to acknowledge today that children come, can participate in their own protection. I was involved in a study of children today, and children have insight, and survivors have insight into what was occurring at the time, they noticed things that made them feel unsafe. And that really challenges us all to, to hear children's voice when they feel uncertain, when they feel an icky feeling. It may be wrong or right, but we've got to listen. And children can participate in this process. Um, the trauma-informed response is, is really critical. Um, across redress, across advocacy, and across support services. And that requires that partnership collaboration with survivor-led organisations, professional organisations, government and institutions. Legislative reform is, is a whole big topic that the Commission will be addressing. And the trauma reform, so now the police are being required to do trauma reform, the corrections are being required to look at trauma informed responses, that the criminal justice system is being reviewed. We're no longer going to be allowing perpetrators to further manipulate the system where they, they might offend against six people without have a single offence against, a single trial against one and one and one other. They will now have to come together and be held together. There will be clear directions around memory so that the uh, defence can't mess around with memory, what, have we, uh, what we now understand about memory. And that's probably one of the best uh, pieces of research published, uh, the only in the last like, four months around this, that stuff. So it's recognising now, it's really a question, and I, we're not saying, you know, this is how you do it, because I, I, what I'd say is what's happened in Australia is uh, they've done a good job. Of course, there's bits for improvement around this but it is about having a public focus on this and laying bare the realities of the past. Because the past is never, all conversations about the past are present conversations. They are about, they are about here and now, about people living with that. And how we deal with that, that, the past is about how we improve things in the present and support survivors in that process. That's one of the things the Royal Commission has been really clear about. It's been great because one of the things also you hear the commissioners speak about how it has been transformative for them who have been judges and in positions of influence or psychiatrists where how they will never do another assessment the same way again. The first thing they will sit down and say, I will listen to the person and hear what's been happened to them in their life. There are judges who are saying, well, I used to send in these people, now I have a different perspective on this. And so it's been transformative for them, and they're invested in making, as we all are, in improving the future. But we just don't know. We can't step back now. It's still bringing forward to get the states on board. So, rather provocatively here, we have a heading, Life After the Royal Commission, a legacy of ongoing action, or a file in the National Library. And this is a real crossroads for us here. This has to be an ongoing action, form of action. And um, so it's actually the most critical time since the Royal Commission uh, commenced. Um, and we need to think about the, the men and women who haven't had an opportunity, for whatever reason, to come forward and tell their story to the state, to the institution, to bear witness. We need to think about the services that have est been established, that have created and addressed some needs. And those services have addressed some far more survivors than survivors that have come forward. And building that legacy across building knowledge. And we still have a challenge about limited state and institutional commitment, particularly when it comes to resources, compensation, community education and justice. And you know, we need to be, 
We can't be silent on this after the Royal Commission. And that's, I mean, that's a really key thing in planning an inquiry here, is not only planning how you do the inquiry, what do you do after? Thank you very much. Thank you.